Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. How are you? Hey, good to see you. We've got a good crowd out here tonight. i got these bright lights. I can barely see most of you. My name is Mark Cox. I am the host of the Mark Cox Morning Show on FM News Talk 97.1. It's great to see all of you tonight, and uh, glad you could make it out. I know you're going to enjoy our speaker series, the H.F. Langenberg Memorial Speaker Series that we're having this evening with these two gentlemen, and uh, we're going to get into some great discussions. We're going to get my friend uh, Bill McClellan from The Post out here who's going to moderate and ask a lot of the questions tonight, and, and uh, as soon as we get a presentation from from our two speakers. So uh, we certainly appreciate you being here. I don't know, uh, any of you up at five in the morning? Raise your hand. A few. I've got a few in the audience. So my alarm goes off at three every morning. Can I just tell you that? And uh, thrilled thrilled to be here with you. Uh, I work from five in the morning until about nine every day and usually go home and get a good nap and then I can stay up and do things like this. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight and thrilled that you all turned out. We've got a great turnout. That's fantastic. You're going to hear from uh, Dr. Robert Frank uh, sitting to my immediate left here who is uh, from Cornell University, Department of Economics, and uh, his uh, latest book is Success and Luck. And seated across from him at the table here is Dr. Charles Murray from the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, His latest book is called Coming Apart. Uh, and we are going to uh, be t- discussing culture and opportunity in America tonight from a couple of different points of view, and I think you're going to enjoy the presentation as much as I do. So before, without any further delay, because we're trying to keep things on track here tonight and rolling, so we have plenty of time for discussion and then uh, some Q&A with our guests a little later, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let me uh, introduce uh, your, your, uh, your moderator for the evening. Uh, he is a gentleman who I will... Uh, jokingly say has had more discussions with Hillary Clinton, at least I think that's who he was talking about in all those columns, uh, than anybody in the House tonight. And he is uh, Bill McClellan with The Post, uh, one of my favorite columnists from The Post-Dispatch. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill McClellan. Thank you very much. Bill, come on out. There you are, my friend. Well, we're going right to the presentations, I believe, aren't we? All right, and uh, who goes first, Mr. Murray or Mr. Frank? Okay, Mr. Frank. Thank you, Bill. Sure. I'm honored to be your guest tonight, uh, and it's great to see Charles Murray again. We probably last shared a podium 20 years ago, we decided, and and often in, in the years before that, so it was very nice to make connections again with with Charles. Uh, Our topic is culture and opportunity, and I'm going to make a couple of very simple points. They've said don't take more than 20 minutes, so I'm going to do my best not to do that. Uh, The the obvious thing that all of us knows is that culture is immensely important. Uh, We're the most social creatures out there. Uh, Culture is the milieu in which we all swim. It shapes everything we think, we do, we say. Uh, Nothing escapes its influence. Uh, That's all fairly obvious. That's the the man bites, uh, the dog bites man part of the the talk. The, the, The point that gets much less notice is that we influence culture. And I tried to draw a diagram to encapsulate the point I'm trying to make. The, the big arrow is culture's effect on us uh, in the slide shown uh, on the screen there. Uh, we take that into account, often not knowing we're taking it into account, but it influences uh, in, a, in a, a profound uh, variety of ways. What we don't take into account and have no rational reason in most cases to take into account is that what we do influences the culture in turn. Uh, In fact, it's the aggregate of what we all do, taken together, that creates culture in the first place. Uh, Culture influences sometimes in neutral ways, uh, sometimes in positive ways, but often for the worse. It makes us do things that are really not in our interest to do. And so we therefore, I think, have a legitimate interest in how what we do affects the culture that in turn shapes us. Let me uh, go back to first principles about why culture matters in some of the ways it does and ask you to consider the following question. Which of the two vertical lines, which of the two vertical lines shown in the slide uh, is longer? Uh, Look carefully. Uh, If 
If you're like most people, uh, you suspect that it's a trick question. Why would I ask uh, unless there were some trick involved? Uh, and so smart people like you will often say, oh, they're the same length. And in fact, you're right. They are the same length. I made the one on the left by first making the one on the right and then hitting the duplicate button on my drawing program. So they're the same length, all right, but how many of you think that they look the same length? Uh, if you raise your hand saying that you do, you should schedule an appointment with your neurologist. There's something the matter with your brain uh, if you think they look the same length. Uh, the context in which the two lines sit is supposed to make them look different to you. The line on the right is supposed to look longer to the human brain. I trust it does to most of you. Uh, context shapes every evaluation we make. Uh, it's hard to find an example, at any rate, of, of one that isn't shaped by it. Uh, distance. Are we almost there yet? Uh, if 10 miles remain on our 12-mile journey, we're not almost there yet. If those exact same 10 miles remain on our 120-mile journey, uh, the answer to the question is different. Yes, we're almost there. Temperature. Is it cold out? If you're in Montreal on a 60-degree afternoon in March, is it cold out? They think you're stupid if you ask that question. Of course it's not cold out. Look at people celebrating the, the warm weather in their T-shirts. If you grew up in Miami, where I did, and somebody says, is it cold out on a 60-degree day in November, you know the answer, too, but it's the very opposite answer. It's freezing out. We wore, wore every bit of heavy clothing we could muster under the circumstances. So uh, let me uh, use an example to illustrate some of the points I want to make about how context shapes the behavior and why we have an interest in molding our own behavior with an eye toward how it affects the resulting context. I started smoking in 1959. I was, at the time, 14 years old. Uh, it was very uh, uh, common for people to smoke at that time. Um, more than 60% of American adults smoked then. Both of my parents smoked. They didn't want me to smoke. Uh, it was awkward for them to tell me I shouldn't smoke when, when both of them smoked. Uh, my friends, uh, many of them had been smoking for a year or two already. It was totally normal for somebody in my situation at that time to smoke cigarettes at that age. Uh, was that a good thing uh, that I started? I, I don't think it was a good thing. Uh, I read a book about all the damage smoking causes to you. I was motivated to quit smoking. And unlike most people who try to quit smoking, uh, about half of smokers try once a year at least to, to quit smoking, and 90% and of them fail to do so. I quit smoking before I went to college, and I, I breathe a sigh of relief that I haven't had any inclination to smoke ever since then. Most people who smoke wish they didn't. Uh, nine, more than 90% wish they didn't. Uh, and, and so the conditions that lead people to smoke we don't think of as supportive of our interests. My sons, I have four adult sons, none of them smokes. Uh, if, if they had grown up when I did, I once said to a friend, I thought at least three of them would be a smoker. One of my sons was present when I said that. He said, which, which three? And I said, well, uh, 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 I thought David would. I, I, I thought uh, uh, Hayden would. I, I thought... Uh, uh, that, that uh, Jason would, but I, 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 I didn't know about you. He said uh, he too would have been a smoker. He'd been a musician in New York. He seemed to think I was dissing him by, by saying that he wouldn't have smoked if he'd grown up when I, I grew up. But it was a totally different environment when, when they grew up. It, it's now about 15% of adults who smoke. Uh, that's a, a, it's not the thing to do to smoke in the current environment. In some sub, subgroups it is, but uh, we count that as a good thing. Most parents say to themselves, I hope my kids don't grow up to be smokers. What, what a bizarre thing it would be to hear a parent say, I hope my kids grow up to smoke. We've never heard any parent say that. If that's a legitimate goal, what sort of steps are we allowed to take in order to see them succeed at that goal? Well, what we've done is created an environment that's very different from the one that influenced me to smoke by uh, taxing cigarettes very heavily. I could buy a pack of Camel cigarettes for 25 cents in the 1950s. Now it's $13 in New York to buy that same pack. You can't smoke in public parks and buildings and restaurants and bars in, in, in most states. 
those steps have had an enormous impact on the fra fraction of people in the United States who smoke, and that means every parent now who wants to raise a child to be a non-smoker is more likely to succeed in achieving that perfectly laudable and legitimate goal. So are those steps that we've taken legitimate to discourage smoking? Uh, I think they are, but we haven't really thought clearly about why we've taken them. In the U.S., I think more than in any other country I've had experience in, people are uh, hostile to the government telling them what they can and cannot do. Uh, the, the idea that you would uh, not be able to smoke when and where you want is a, is a tough pill for many people to swallow. And the, the fact is, uh, we... we uh, cater to that sentiment very strongly when we adopt regulations that, that try to prevent people from doing what they want to when they want to do it. John Stuart Mill, who is the, the patron saint of liberalism, uh, said the only legitimate reason for telling somebody that she can't do what she wants to do is to prevent her from causing undue harm to other people to say that it's for her own good or that she'd be happier in the long run if she didn't do it, that's not sufficient. You have to justify regulating people's behavior by uh, showing that you prevent harm from being caused to other people. Well, we have done that. We've tried to do that. And the way we've tried to do it is to offer as a, reg a rationale for smoking regulations the fact that we need to protect innocent bystanders from the consequences of secondhand smoke. There are negative consequences of secondhand smoke. Uh, there are illnesses that are, are linked to them. The problem is that unless you work in a crowded bar with no ventilation for eight hours a day, those consequences, for the most part, are minuscule compared to the consequences of actually being a smoker. The regulators don't dare say we want to protect smokers from harming themselves, uh, but what the smoking regulations do in terms of preventing harm is an enormous amount of harm prevented to smokers themselves who don't smoke because of the regu regulations. But the real harm that's prevented by smoking regulations is of yet a different sort, and it's of precisely the, the, the kind of harm that I want to point to uh, in talking about our interest in molding individual behavior with an eye toward its effect on the culture that shapes what we do. By far, the most important determinant of whether somebody is going to smoke is the fraction of people in his peer group who smoke. <clears throat> if there's a 30% increase in the number of people in someone's peer group who smoke, the probability that person will start smoking himself goes up by 25%. If you run it all out and make reasonable assumptions about how many uh, groups intersect and to what degree, uh, preventing one people from smoking has an enormous multiplier effect. Every person that know now has one person less in his peer group who smokes. Every one of them is then less likely to become a smoker. And then every one uh, of those who doesn't become a smoker, all their peer groups have one less smoker in them and so on out on out to infinity, we prevent an enormous amount of harm uh, to justify taxes and regulations on where you can smoke in terms of the scale of the harm prevented. If this is the harm we're preventing, it's a very easy exercise. Uh, the burden of proof would be on somebody who said, no, that's not reason enough to, to tell people that they shouldn't smoke when they want to. So again, you can think about the effect uh, of the cigarette taxes and the other prohibitions as creating a change in the incentives of the individual. Uh, in the first slide I showed you, those arrows uh, going from him to the crowd, his influence on the surrounding culture, were so thin you probably didn't even notice that there were any arrows. The taxes on cigarettes make those arrows look really big to him. And so he considers the effect of his own actions on people's attitudes and behavior in the broader uh, arena. And, and that's, a, that's a step that we have every reason to think uh, case by case about whether it makes sense to take. Uh, I'll look at one more, more example before uh, yielding the, the floor to Charles. Uh, here's one that many people have objected to. Uh, it's, it's the fact that government forces people to save for retirement. In effect, it forces them to do so. 
uh, in this country through the social security system. What the government says is that when you work, we're going to collect 15 percent of your earnings and taxes, half from you, half from your employer, and then we're going to use that money to pay retirees benefits, uh, supplemental income in re retirement, your social security uh, payments. Milton Friedman and others uh, have objected that that's not a legitimate step for government to take. That step, they argue, deprives individuals of the right to decide for themselves how much to save, in what forms to save, and when to save, and so on. It forces you into a one-size-fits-all savings program. Uh, that's, that observation is absolutely true, but it begs the question, uh, is forcing people to do that a bad thing, all things con considered? Uh, and, and so here, too, I think there's uh, an interpretation of that regulation that is exactly congruent with the notion that if what we do affects the environment in ways that harm others, that's a legitimate rationale for trying to curtail the extent to which we do those things. So I'll start by describing to you what uh, uh, has happened in the, the economy for the last 40 years. Most of the income gains have been concentrating in the hands of top earners. Top earners have been behaving normally. They've been spending more money on everything, including building bigger houses. There's no evidence that the middle class gets angry when they see the pictures of the big houses. They seem to enjoy seeing them. The people just below the top, though, their frame of reference gets uh, altered when they attend social functions in the houses of the people at the top. Maybe now we, we feel we have to have our own daughter's wedding reception at home rather than in a hotel or other rented space. We build bigger. People just below us now need a dining room for 24 rather than 18. They build bigger. And it cascades all the way down the income ladder so that the people in the middle are now spending... Uh, uh, they're building houses, the median house uh, in the middle is about 50% larger in, in terms of footprint than it was in 1970. This despite the fact that the median earner doesn't earn any more in real terms than in 1970. For men, actually, the real wage is a little less than it was then. People in the middle are experiencing a squeeze because they're buying houses that are bigger than they can afford. Now, you might say the obvious solution is to tell them, just suck it up. You don't need to have a house as big as other people are buying. Uh, if you can't afford it, don't buy it. That would be, I think, a perfect solution except for one thing. It's that where you live determines where your kids go to school. And what's true in every jurisdiction around the world is that the better schools, what's a good school? It's, it's a relative concept. It's a quintessentially relative concept. It's one that's better than other schools in the area. The, the better schools are the ones always and everywhere, the ones located in the more expensive neighborhoods. So if you want to send your child to a better school, the very most effective step you can take is to spend more on a house. That means that virtually every parent confronts some version of this dilemma. You can save enough to support your standard of living in retirement, or B, you can save too little to do that and use the money instead to purchase a house in a better school district. Neither one of these choices is attractive. That's why it's a dilemma. And what do parents do? In almost every case, they opt for choice B. They shortchange their savings for retirement because you have to solve the school problem now. It, do, it doesn't matter if you had more money later in your life cycle. You have to solve that problem now. And you worry about what to do in retirement when the time comes. And what we know is that in countries that don't have retirement support programs of the sort we have, retirees almost always experience a precipitous decline in their material living standards when they stop working. The Social Security uh, system crudely but fairly unintrusively solves this dilemma for people. The payroll tax money that they pay isn't available to bid for a house in a better school district. And the 
pension they receive that's financed out of the transfers made available from that money is enough to keep their standard of living close enough to where it was during their working lives. We see these kinds of arms races in other domains all across the board. Uh, for example, in weddings now, the average wedding in the U.S. as of 2015 cost $31,000. This is in inflation adjusted dollars. That's almost three times as much as the average wedding in 1980. Uh, are couples happier because they're spending more on weddings? There's absolutely no evidence that they are. There's, in fact, a recent study that showed that couples who spend between twenty and $30,000 on their weddings are 12% more likely to divorce in any year than those who spend between five and $10,000. Why are people spending more? Because others like them are spending more. And why are they spending more? Because people at the top are spending more. And why are they spending more? Because they have more money. Income inequality creates spending externalities that affect everybody up and down the population in ways that uh, it cannot be resolved by individual action. There's very few steps individuals can take to, to solve these kinds of problems. A very unintrusive solution, and I'll quit with this thought, is to scrap the current income tax and in its place adopt a much more steeply progressive tax on how much people spend each year. What we know is that uh, uh, under this system, people would report their income to the IRS the same as they do now. Uh, that's not uh, easy, but we know how to do that. We report savings. Uh, how much did your savings go up this year? We know how to do that from tax-exempt retirement accounts that, uh, w that require that. The difference between your income and your savings is how much you spent during the year. And that amount, minus a big standard deduction, is your taxable consumption. Here's the Jones family. They earn $50,000 a year. They save $5,000. The standard deduction is $30,000. So their taxable consumption is their income, $50,000, minus the $30,000 standard deduction, minus the $5,000 savings. They pay tax on a taxable consumption level of $15,000. The tax rate starts out low. Their total tax is lower than under the current income tax, or about the same. But the rate then rises as people's taxable consumption goes up. And unlike the income tax, there's no limit on how the marginal rate can, how high the marginal rate can go. We're not worried about choking off savings and investment by having high marginal rates, because the higher those rates are, the stronger the incentives to save and invest. So here, here's the, the comparison that I want to call your attention to. We've got two worlds. One with a progressive consumption tax, that's the world on the right, one without a progressive consumption tax. That's the current system, the one that we have now. The rich in each world buy the best car they can afford. In the, in the low-tax world, uh, uh, the rich buy a Ferrari Berlinetta for $333,000. In the progressive consumption tax world, they can afford only the Porsche 911 Turbo. $150,000. So the question then is, who's happier? The rich people in this world, they don't see one another, uh, or the rich people in this world? Uh, if the Ferrari is a better car in absolute terms, it's better by the tiniest of margins. Every design and performance feature that matters is already incorporated into the Porsche. If the Ferrari is better, it's not better by much. And really, the main satisfaction the rich are taking is from the knowledge that they're driving the best car out there. And that would be the same in both cases. So if I had to bet, I would say that if everything else were the same in the two worlds, the rich would be equally happy. The culture is different in the two worlds. Uh, but because the culture is different, the incentives that create uh, individual spending decisions uh, are different. That's why the culture is different. This wouldn't be the only difference between the two worlds. It wouldn't just be that the rich here drive Porsches and the rich there drive Ferrari Berlinettas. We would also see that from the extra revenue from the progressive, progressive consumption tax, the rich in the progressive consumption tax world would drive their cars on roads that were maintained to a much higher standard. So the real question is, is this, who's happier? Somebody who drives a $300,000 Ferrari on roads riddled with foot-deep potholes. Or somebody who drives 
the lowly $150,000 Porsche on smoothly maintained roads. I think that's a no-brainer. Uh, I've never met anybody who's interested in cars who would answer the question differently. Of course, it's the Porsche driver who would be happier under the circumstances. And that's because people spend their money in ways that take no account of the context that shapes what they're doing. If everybody spent less, they'd be happier. But I can't control what I do. Uh, I, can control, I, I can control only what I do. I can't control what others spend. With collective measures that influence what we do as individuals, we can help mold the culture in ways that produce outcomes that are better for each of us. We create opportunities literally out of thin air by doing such things. I talk a lot more about this in... in uh, my 2016 book, Success and Luck, I've got a whole uh, appendix chapter describing the, the manifold advantages of changing our incentives in this way. Uh, and again, I thank you for turning out on, on this night. You had lots of other things you could have done. You took time out to come listen to Charles and me, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for that. Thank you, Mr. Frank, and uh, we'll be taking a smoke break in just a minute. I'm teasing. Uh, and and uh, now we'll hear from Mr. Charles Murray. This was not billed as a debate for a very good reason, and that is that a great deal of the work that Bob Frank has done has informed my own thinking, and I agree with a great deal of it. Uh, for example, the consumption tax that you just heard about, uh, I'm all in on that. Uh, I think it's a great idea. But I'm going to talk about a different aspect of culture and opportunity uh, that has nothing to do with the choice between Ferraris and uh, Porsches, which I found to be a very interesting uh, uh, comparison, but rather has to do with what I feel is currently a very destructive way of thinking about culture and opportunity that is shared in different ways by both the left and the right. And that is what I call Lake Wobegon Romanticism. For those of you who are familiar with Lake Wobegon, uh, the famous uh, show by Garrison Keillor, he had as the closing of every show that uh, that's the news from Lake Wobegon where all the men are good looking, the women are strong, and all the children are above average. There is an idea about opportunity that partakes of the assumption that all the children are above average. So if you are a libertarian or as I am a classical liberal, which is essentially a wishy-washy libertarian, uh, then you say that in a free society you will have prodigious production of opportunities for people, not only opportunities uh, for people with PhDs, but opportunities for people who can start small businesses and the rest. And that's the one thing you want to maximize. And on the left you have romanticism in the form of all we have to do is provide better educations for people and they will all be able to go out and get PhDs and become college faculty members or perhaps something else if there's uh, appeals to them. Both of those ways of looking at opportunity and culture are fine for people who have not gotten the short end of the stick on a wide variety of measures. And I have to say that Bob Frank's book that, uh, that I recommend very high, well, two, a couple of them. One is The Winner Take All Society, uh, which I believe you co-authored, right? Uh, and, and the most recent one, Success and Luck, I think deal with a lot of these issues in a very smart and helpful way. I'm going to talk about it in terms of drawing the short end of the stick as a matter of luck and how you enable people how you give them the opportunity to nonetheless live a satisfying life. Now, what, I, what do I mean by unlucky? I'm not talking about socioeconomic status. I think the whole idea of privilege that is currently abroad in the land and, and white privilege and, and uh, male privilege and the rest of it kind of misses the point, and especially the idea that there is 
more privileged, the higher you are in the socioeconomic status ladder, just doesn't make any sense to me. A great many of uh, the people in the audience, I bet, are parents. And, and think of it this way. Suppose that you could choose the ideal socioeconomic status in which to raise your child. I would be real surprised if any of you thought that billionaires have an easier time raising their children well than middle class people do. Working for AEI, I happen to know a couple of billionaires with children, and I would not trade places with them for anything because of all the difficulties they have in imparting certain kinds of values and the rest of it to kids when the kids know that they got a billion dollars in back of them when they grow up. So it wouldn't be at the very top. And in fact, when you try to pin down what is privilege in terms of, of, of being in the best position to have kids and raise them, money is not all that big a deal. Other things are more important. Similarly, with a lot of other kinds of ways that we ordinarily think of advantage and disadvantage and the rest of it, and luck and lack of luck, I think we need to focus more closely on a few really important things. Uh, I doubt if you know about it, but I've written a book about IQ with Dick Kernstein one time, so I know a lot, I know a lot about IQ, and I'm here to tell you, regardless of what you may have read elsewhere, you do not deserve your IQ. You may have studied hard, you may be conscientious, you may have done all the right things, and that's fine. Those are virtues that you can be proud of. You cannot be proud of your IQ. Whether it's uh, genes, which play an important role, or whether it's environment, which also plays a role, you haven't had any control over either one of those things in terms of making you who you are in terms of IQ. And yet, guess what? We now live in a world which is as if it were tailor-made to provide the maximum number of opportunities for people who have simple, raw, intellectual brain power. And that advantage that has been uh, conceded to those who have that kind of luck has gotten greater and greater and greater as technology has uh, improved and as wealth has increased. That was, even though nobody realizes it, the story of the bell curve. Well, that's pure luck. Now you can say IQ isn't everything, and that's right. Uh, on the, there are all sorts of other things that determine success in life. There are things like persistence, uh, courage, charm, beauty, uh, a whole variety, a whole bundle of different characteristics, some of which we have some control over, but a lot of that is a matter of luck, too. If we are beautiful, it's not really that much because of anything we did, even though maybe we can gild the lily a little bit. And the same goes with charm. In most cases, that's not a problem because we are complicated bundles of strengths and weaknesses. That's why some of the people that you know who have stratospheric IQs are completely socially inept, and you would not trust them to go across the street to buy a loaf of bread for you. Uh, it's, it's why other people who are charming uh, aren't that smart, but they can get lots of places in life. You, you take all the different kinds of skills, all the different kinds of abilities people have. They're strong in some, weak in others, and it's what make the world, makes the world go round and makes the world a more interesting place. But what happens if you have drawn the short end of the stick on a variety of dimensions? You aren't very smart. You're below average in intelligence. Uh, you aren't beautiful. You aren't handsome. You aren't particularly smart, uh, charming. And going down the list, you aren't particularly persistent. And the rest of it, you go down the list. This does not make you a bad person. On the contrary, the whole idea of America is that this person ought to be able to live a satisfying life. But in thinking about social policy, we very seldom put it in those terms. And that's what I'd like to address more specifically tonight. How is it that people who have drawn the short end of the stick can reach the age that Bob and I are at, we're within a couple of years of each other, and he gave it away by telling you he was 14 in 1959. Uh, how do you get to be our age and be proud of who you have been and what you have done, even if you've drawn the short end of the stick on things that are a matter of luck? My proposition to you is that actually, and this is true of all of us, there are really only four domains 
within which we get the kinds of long-term satisfactions with life as a whole that together make up the really significant meaning of happiness. And those four domains are family, community, vocation, and faith. I, I've challenged audiences to give me something I've left out. And the best uh, response to that is that people have causes that they take up that are uh, deeply satisfying. And that is true, but that partakes a lot of both vocation in some cases and faith in other cases. Uh, but the general proposition is lasting and justified satisfaction with your life really is concentrated in family, community, vocation, and faith. You don't have to tap all four of those. There are happy atheists, there are happy single people, uh, but you better tap more than just one if you're going to live a satisfying life. Well, here's where you have a kind of upside-down pyramid. You know, usually we think in terms of society as a broad base at the bottom, and then you get up a narrower and narrower, and up the tippy-tippy top is uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, Bill Gates. If you think about the opportunities to live a satisfying life, there's kind of an upside-down pyramid. If you are one of the lucky ones with all sorts of talents and all sorts of resources and so forth, you can put together a wide variety of ways of living your life that tap those domains and provide satisfactions to you. The farther down you go in terms of your constellation of abilities and assets, the fewer such ways of, of uh, living a satisfying life are available to you. You aren't going to be rich. You aren't going to be famous. You aren't going to have a lot of the other kinds of things that people seek as measures of success in life. But there remain for you a few. You can say when you get to be our age, uh, I was, I was uh, a good parent. I had a wonderful marriage. Uh, I was a good neighbor. I always pulled my own weight. Those are not just good things to be able to say of a life, things that warrant you being satisfied with who you have been and what you have done. They are some of the best things you can say. They are the kinds of things that I bet Bob and I agree become more important and not less as you get older and the accomplishments of your professional career and whether you publish a lot of books and the rest of that become less important than those other things. My point is those are basically the only ways that people have gotten the short end of the stick can live satisfying lives. And that, it seems to me, makes it incumbent upon us to think in terms of social policy as to how they affect, how social policy affects the vitality of those institutions. The extent, how is it that social policy either reinforces or undermines the vitality and richness of family life, the vitality and richness of community life, and so forth. The answer, I'm afraid, is that social policy in general over the last century has been going in precisely the wrong direction. That it has oftentimes with the best of intentions taken a lot of the stuffing out of the stuff of life. By that I mean take community as an example. Why is it that a community is a vital place where people are mutually engaged in solving problems? Well, there are a number of answers to that question, but a very important part of it is because the community has things that need to get done and they won't get done unless the community does it. Why is it that families are strong? Uh, that people not only get married, but that marriage is a rich source of satisfaction? Again, out of the many different answers that might be given to that question, one of the important ones is because if the parents of the family don't do certain things, if the husband doesn't do certain things, if the wife doesn't do certain things, they won't get done. And th the feedback loops are, in, in the terms of culture, that guess what? If communities have to get certain functions done or they won't get done, then there are lots of rewards that people in communities give to other people who are doing the right thing. And by the way, there's also a lot of stigma 
that is attached to doing the wrong thing. And the same thing is true of families. And a great deal of what social policy has de facto done is to remove a lot of the trouble of getting those things done, or try to remove, take the trouble out of life. So you have people who fall on hard times, you have women who have children, they do not have a husband to help support them, they are legitimate objects of society's concern, we want to do something about it, so we have programs to try to help. I am not complaining about the intentions of those, I'm not even really talking about how effective or ineffective they have been in terms of their stated immediate objectives, I'm making another, I, I think, more subtle statement, which is they inevitably also take some of the responsibility away from the family, away from the community, and in the process of that, diminish the importance of those institutions and diminish their value as sources of satisfaction. Think for a minute about why it is that you yourself, forget about these other people we're talking about who have been unlucky in life, just think about the things that you have taken great satisfaction from in your life and lasting satisfaction. Things that even today, years after you did them maybe, you're still proud of. I, I, I suggest that there are three different things that have to be involved in that. First, it, it took a lot of effort. There are very few things, you know, you, there are all sorts of cliches in the language to talk about this. You get out of something what you put into it. Nothing worth having comes easily and so forth. And the reason there are cliches is there's a lot of truth to it. If you put a lot of effort into something, that all by itself makes it important. Another thing is that you have responsibility for the outcome that occurred. It doesn't have to be total responsibility. Uh, I hear lots of times of construction workers who go back to look at a building they worked on or a bridge that they worked on and feel enormous sense of pride at looking at it because they can't say, I built that, but they can genuinely say, I helped to build that. This is true, by the way, the, the, the level of satisfaction and the, with the responsibility that you bear for it exists within the same family in terms of the raising of children. I have four children, uh, and I have to say that whereas I have been a loving father, I like to think, and a good father, uh, my wife Catherine has put enormously more time and effort into the raising of those children than I did. And guess what? Whereas I'm really happy about how well the kids turned out and I'm proud of them, I think it's fair to say that the depth and richness of her satisfaction at what she did is deeper than mine because I don't think that I deserve the same kind of satisfaction because I wasn't nearly as involved in it as she was. There are all kinds of things like that where we can see that in our own life. And the third thing, by the way, that it has to be in order to be something that you take deep satisfaction in a long time after you did it is it had to be something important that you were doing and family and community are about as important as things get. And so I'm talking about, in terms of social policy, my own attempts to come up with ways in which we can use social policy to take communities that have all started to fall apart, especially in the working class, that we can take families that have, well, marriage has pretty much collapsed in large portions of, of, of the working class, take those and try to revitalize those and give back to people the kinds of opportunities that can make them reach the age of 70 and look back at who they have been and what they have done with satisfaction. And whereas Bob has the consumption tax, I have the universal basic income. Now, it may sound odd for a libertarian or classical liberal, whatever you want to call me, to be in favor of giving everybody over the age of 21 an annual income guaranteed no matter what, uh, but there is a little catch to all of this. It would replace the entire transfer payment systems that we have now. Everything from aid to families with dependent children or its current version and to up to Social Security. It would replace all of those things now, I'm not going to give you an extended 
discussion of why I want to do that, but I want to give you some indication of how we have to start thinking more imaginatively about how we can affect the sources of satisfaction in people's lives who are not as lucky as we are. For one thing, giving people an income stream all by itself is a way of restoring moral agency to people who have abdicated their, abdicated their own moral agency or feel that it has been taken from, a, from them. By moral agency, I mean the feeling that you are responsible for the consequences of your actions and that you are a human being who can make choices and, and you can take responsibility for them. In part, changing our social policy so that it shifted to a universal basic income would give people moral agency whether they wanted it or not. The lights are so bright up here, I can't tell what proportion of the audience is under the age of 50. This will be meaningless to people under the age of 50, most of them. I call it the Doolittle effect. After uh, uh, Eliza Doolittle's uh, father in My Fair Lady, who received a lot of money uh, in the course of the, uh, of the musical comedy that I'm referring to, and as a result of that, he was kind of forced by circumstance to adopt bourgeois values, whereas he'd been a very happy, shiftless, no good bum until then. Well, that's what an income stream does to you. So that if you have an income stream and you've been a, a, one of those people like Mr. Doolittle, living with your girlfriend without uh, paying anything to support the rent and saying, honey, I'd really like to help, but I just can't get a job, uh, all at once, if she knows that you are having a deposit electronically to a known bank account on the first of every month, she has ways of saying, you know, Joe, I think it's time he started to kick in a little help with the rent. He has achieved moral agency kicking and screaming and not wanting it. He has achieved moral agency in an even more uh, draconian sense if he fathers a child and walks away from it. We have child support laws in the books right now. Uh, they are, cannot be enforced against low-income fathers. They disappear, they don't pay, it's the rest of it. Well, if you have the universal basic income, you don't need to. All you need to do is have the judge issue an order and some part of that monthly deposit never reaches the guy because it is siphoned off to pay the child support that, in my view, he is morally obligated to pay. You think that will get the attention of young men as they look at older brothers who are on the hook for those kinds of things, you think that might introduce a new moral uh, thinking into what are the responsibilities of siring a child? I'm not saying it would solve everything, it would certainly change the moral calculus. Now imagine millions of these kinds of conversations going on every day. That's, that's one way in which I think you can look to a revitalization of moral agency. But also think about the revitalization of civic culture. All at once you have vast new resources that are being pumped into lower, low income communities. Now those, that money is not going to be spent uh, on community goods because anybody compels them to do so. But you will have the resources to solve problems that right now they do not have the resources to solve internally. So I'm going to leave it at that. And, uh, and, and uh, in, instead engages in a, in a conversation about all the topics that have been raised. But I have proposed this solution, which has not got a snowball's chance in hell of ever happening, to try to give you, to try to indicate to you the importance of shifting the way we think about trying to do good by using the government. And start to recognize that we have for far too long, talked about those people we are trying to help, when I suggest to you that we will get better ideas and better policies if instead we ask what we want and need in our own lives. I will conclude with a thought experiment that I first proposed in 1984 in a book called Losing Ground and I've stuck with ever since because I gets, think it gets to the nub of the matter. Suppose you are a parent with an infant or other very small child, and somehow you can know that tomorrow your child will be orphaned. You or your spouse will be run over by a bus or something, and you have a choice. You may leave your child with a couple that is 
quite poor. And your child will indeed sometimes be shabbily dressed and be made fun of by schoolmates at uh, school. Sometimes your child may be hungry. But this couple has worked hard all their lives. Uh, They will envelop your child in love, and they will also teach your child the importance of independence and integrity and all the other things that you would like to teach your child. Or you may put your child with a couple who will not abuse your child, uh, but they've never worked. They have plenty of money. They have a nice house, plenty of food, plenty of clothes, but they won't be able to oversee your child's education. They will not teach your child about the importance of integrity and honesty and the other values. Which family do you leave your infant child to to be raised? If you, like me, say it's a no-brainer, I'm going to put them with a poor family, then you have to say, well, if that's what I would want for my own child, why am I engaged in arguing for social policies or thinking about social policies in ways which assume that that is not something that is shared by everybody. In the process of saying we need to construct opportunity in this culture in the ways that we would want it for those we hold nearest and dearest, we will have a powerful framework within which, within which to come up with better ideas. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd I'd like to say that uh, I'm uh, proud to be here. I wish I could say it's pleasant, but it's, I'm a little nervous being with two public intellectuals. But I'm I'm proud to be here just because L- Lyndon Wood is doing this. There's a lot of universities that. Uh, don't stand for free speech and the free exchange of ideas. And, and I think we owe Lyndon Wood a, a debt of gratitude for doing this. And I'm referring, of course, to Mr. Murray, who for many years has been a uh, bete noir, a, a villain, to many of my fellow travelers because of the book The Bell Curve. So before I ask questions about uh, society and their views on that, I'd like to ask one bell curve question, and, and Mr. Murray, that is, I remember when your book came out, it was a few years after uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, and I had gone out and bought that book and realized it was over my head and didn't read it, and then your book came out, and it was an important book, so I went out and bought that, and again, it, it, I couldn't read it with all the charts and the statistics, and I, as if I was reading Lady, Chatter, Lady Chatterley's Lover, I went immediately to the dirty part, which I think was chapter 13. Uh, Cognitive, uh, differences in cognitive ability in ethnic groups, and and there was, you know, Asians, and then Caucasians, and then blacks. And that was a very brief part of the book, but it became the core of the book for the people who hadn't read it. And even though the book, you know, I've gone back and reread it, and I know it's, it's... more about how uh, cognitive, cognitive ability has become the coin of the realm and how does society deal with the disparities in cognitive abilities, especially on either end, uh, on this end where the people get funneled to certain universities and become isolated, marry each other, and then on this end where they're dysfunctional. But because of the mention of race, you got a certain reputation and people overlooked what the book was about. So my only question, Mr. Murray, is if you had to do it again, would you include race in that book? Is this on? The answer is yes. But it's not as if we didn't talk about this when uh, we, Richard Hernstein, professor at Harvard, who's my co-author, and we talked about this uh, when we were writing the book, and we, we considered, what if we just don't bring up race? Because the subtitle of The Bell Curve is uh, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life. And it has nothing to do with race. It has to do with what I was talking about in my remarks, which is 
IQ became much more valuable in the marketplace uh, in the 20th century and continues to be more valuable now. And it's had a, it's had a huge effect on, on the uh, nature of America's class structure. We decided it was the elephant in the room so that if we didn't, if we didn't mention uh, uh, racial differences that you would have people saying, well, you know, actually the problems that Turnstein and Murray are talking about are essentially uh, problems of race and class and so forth, and everybody knows that IQ tests don't measure the same thing, uh, they don't measure it accurately in African Americans as they do with Caucasians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it would be used as a way to say we don't have to take any of these issues seriously. And we also, if we left it out, everybody would be... If when I say the elephant in the room, when we talk to people that, about writing the book, the first question they always asked us was about race. It's, it's, it's one of these things that has been a taboo in discussions in the United States, remains a taboo now, but everybody is, is sort of like social science pornography, you know. They, they secretly are really fascinated with it. Um, I want to say to the audience who probably did not read all 980 pages of the bell curve that what Dick and I said was that are there measured differences in IQ test scores between different ethnic groups? And the answer is yes. Do these differences in test scores reflect uh, real differences in cognitive functioning? Yes. <laughs> are, they, are they genetic or environmental? We don't know. The entire, uh, the entire body of evidence for the accusations that probably many of the audience have heard that Murray and Herrnstein uh, said that blacks are genetically inferior to whites was one paragraph. And you will not be surprised to know that I can quote it verbatim. The paragraph goes as follows. This is after we presented a discussion of the arguments regarding uh, nurture and nature as sources of these differences. And we said, if at this point you think that either the environmental or the genetic explanation has won out to the exclusion of the other, we have not done a good enough job of presenting one side or the other. In our opinion, it is highly likely that both nature and nurture are, have something to do with, that was our phrase, have something to do with uh, the differences in test scores. What might the mix be? We are resolutely agnostic. As far as we can tell, the data do not yet provide the basis for an estimate. That's it. That's all we said about <laughs> our conclusions about race and genes and IQ. What, how do we deal with this? Treat people as individuals and judge them by what they bring to the table, not by what group they belong to. And that is true whether we are... That is true whether we are talking about race or whether we are talking about gender or, or any other identity that we have. You will know more about a person's intelligence about all sorts of other things about that person in five minutes of conversation than you will know uh, about from knowing what, what identity they have, what, what group they belong to. And the, tr the great tragedy, I think, uh, of, of the last half century, and it perhaps is the greatest of all the tragedies, is that America's ideal was to treat people as individuals, not groups. We didn't make good on it altogether, but we were making progress toward it. And then in the 1960s, we turned from that to uh, trying to, to, to treating people as groups, but with good intentions. And I think it has just been disastrous on many fronts. And as time goes on, and as we know more and more about the sources of whether it's intelligence or whether it's any other human traits, the more important it becomes, not the less important, the more important it becomes to revert to the ideal that in America we judge people as individuals, not as members of groups. Thank you very much. So, uh, this question to Mr. Frank. You know, on the 
progressive consu consumption tax in Luxury Fever, you, you wrote about it, and you, you described it as a win-win for everybody, including the people who are paying the tax. And you said, seldom have our moral imperatives and our naked self-interest so closely aligned. And that made sense to me, but that was in 1999. And it's almost 20 years later, and we have a billionaire populist president. And if you were to go down to a saloon on the river and ask somebody what they thought about the progressive consumption tax, they'd probably say, I have no idea what you're talking about. If the idea is so good, Mr. Frank, what's happened to it? So, so that's the, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich question. <laughs> Paul Samuelson, the economist, used to love to get that question because he would respond, I am rich. He was the author of a multi-million copy uh, tech, textbook and was quite wealthy as a result of that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a troubling question for me. I, th I think back on my career as I near retirement and, and I have to regard it as a, a, the, the failure I most regret that I wasn't able to make more progress uh, selling the, the appeal of that idea to other people. Uh, we do know that there are circumstances where good ideas take a while to incubate. Uh, I'm encouraged that economists started talking about solutions to the acid rain problem. Uh, when I first moved to Ithaca, we would read uh, articles in the Ithaca Journal and the New York Times almost every day about acid rain and how it was killing the forests in the Adirondacks and there were fish piling up dead on the beaches of the lakes. What was happening was that power plants here in the Midwest were burning high sulfur coal. It was uh, spewing out as SO2 into the, the air from their smokestacks being blown eastward by the prevailing winds and then precipitating out as H2SO4, sulfuric acid, and that was what was causing the dam damage. And economists at the time recommended what they recommend even now, which is that to curb the emissions that cause acid rain, what you want to do is have it no longer to be free to dump stuff into the air. So what they proposed was that if you wanted to dump some SO2 into the air, okay, you can do that, but we're going to set a cap on the amount that will permit, and then to emit one unit of it, you need to buy a one unit permit. We will make those available for sale in the marketplace. Uh, and what we've learned in, in, in the meantime was that that was a very hard idea to sell. Uh, the, the Sierra Club and other environmental groups pounced all over it. What they said in, in response to that proposal was, oh, so let me get this straight. You, you want to let rich firms pollute to their heart's content just by buying these permits. That's, by the way, a very strange vision of how firms make decisions. Uh, firms are not dumping SO2 into the air because they derive pleasure from doing that. They, they dump it into the air because it costs money to filter it out, and we were letting them do it for free. So faced with a choice between dumping it into the air for free or paying money to filter it out when there's no requirement to do that, they, ch they chose the more profitable option, naturally. Finally, uh, this, this was all in the 1970s, finally in 1996, under amendments to the Clean Air Act, we adopted the economist's proposal, which was for uh, a cap-and-trade system in SO2 permits in the Chicago Board of Trade, you can buy and sell these permits. Uh, you can't emit any SO2 without uh, the right amount of permits for the amount you propose to emit. And once that was implemented, almost overnight, SO2 emissions plummeted. Uh, firms suddenly became geniuses at figuring out how to get SO2 out of the air more cheaply than they ever imagined possible. But 30 years elapsed between the proposal and the adoption. How, how am I doing, 20 years? Okay, uh, yes. I, uh, I hope I live long enough to see this I, I'm tax short -sighted. adopted. Uh, you know, people proposed it before I did. In fact, there, there are early uh, examples of the, the argument 
the date from the 1920s. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, this is an envy tax, or we, we're legitimizing people being jealous of their neighbors by tax. Uh, it, it's nothing to do with that. Uh, the, the, these sorts of consumption imbalances would be present in vast quantities, even in a world where not one single person experienced any jealousy or envy of his neighbor's cons consumption. It's just common sense. The, the context that surrounds you defines for you what you feel is adequate. And I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal, as, as, as I think we were talking on the way over here. Charles was a Peace Corps volunteer. I lived in a two-room house with no uh, uh, plumbing, no electricity. Uh, it was a very modest house. If, if I lived in a house like that in Ithaca, my kids wouldn't want their friends to see where we, where we lived. They would be ashamed. I would be ashamed if, if I lived in a house like that. At no moment during the two years I lived in that house did, did the house seem in any way unsatisfactory. I was always proud to invite people over. It served every function that I required of a house in that context. If, if my Nepal friends would see the house I live in in Ithaca, New York, they would think I had taken complete leave of my sen senses. What would anybody need such a grand house as that? They would wonder. Why so many bathrooms? What's the problem here? Uh, they would want to know. But that's the wrong way to think about it, just as it's wrong for us to wag our fingers at the rich when we see that they've built uh, a bigger new mansion. There's a different standard in every local context that defines what you need. Uh, and sometimes you can absent yourself from that standard other, other times, as in the housing example, to, to bail out from being influenced uh, by that standard is to give your kids up to an inferior education when you could do something about that. So, yeah, these are, these are ideas that I hope will eventually take root. You know, I've had politicians come to me and ask, could you do this at the state level or in one case at the province level in Canada? And I, and I tell them, yes, you could do it. Normally you can't have a, an aggressive tax policy in a state because if you tax aggressively in a state, people will move to a, a neighboring state. If you had a progressive consumption tax in a state, smart rich people from surrounding states would want to move to that, that state. They would reckon that if I move there, I won't have to blow all my hard-earned money on building a bigger mansion like everybody else builds such that when we all do it, it just raises the bar that defines how big a mansion we all feel we need. We could build more modest houses and use that money in a variety of other more useful ways. So oh. I don't know. I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm okay, okay. Um, Mr. Murray, it's when kind of I read your stuff, I see that the rich are not just getting rich, they're getting smarter. So do you think that they're going to want to adopt Mr. Uh, Frank's progressive consumption tax? Yeah, I couldn't quite understand. But this, this, we have a big echo, so can you translate this? Do, do, the rich are getting smarter as well as richer. Will they ever see any merit in adopting my tax? Well, you know, this consumption tax is very popular in the libertarian uh, wing uh, as well. And it's, it's partly because it just makes so much sense. You are taxed on what you buy as opposed to uh, what you save. And... Along with the universal basic income, which I said doesn't have a snowball's chance of uh, happening. Well, it doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of happening the way I want it to, which is to replace everything else. But this is another idea where on left and right alike, you are having people from both ends sort of saying, the way we are doing business now doesn't make any sense. And this may be <laughs> some small reason for optimism about the future, that you have new ideas being considered. Uh, th thank you. So, uh, this question comes from uh, William Rogers, who's put this together, and it, and it would be to Mr. Frank. And, uh, and it's, he, he says, gains are usually uh, a combination of luck and effort. And, and uh, of course, you speak about luck. And is there any emotionally accepted way to divide up the gains that come from luck rather than from effort? You know, I think uh, everybody who does really well, uh, in, especially in the kind of markets that uh, Phil Cook and I talked about in the winner-take-all book, 
uh, the, the markets that bestow the really big prizes now are competitive to a degree that we never saw before. The, the people who emerge in those markets, uh, almost all of them are really hardworking. They're all, almost all of them really smart. They have the talents that those, those markets are looking for in, in great measure. But what's also true is that in those very markets, luck is more important than ever before. And, and I think the easiest way to see why that is, is that if there were a thousand people competing for one slot at the top, and, and you had them draw their, their skill from one urn and their, and their luck from another urn, uh, and then you said luck doesn't count for much, maybe 2% of total performance is the, the, the times your luck value plus 98% times your skill value, what you can say will happen is, is very clear. The, the winner of that, con that competition, the one who has the biggest total number, 98 times talent, plus 2%, 98% times talent, 2% times luck, that person will be near the top of the talent distribution. That's true. But rarely will he be the most talented person in the competition. Uh, almost always there will be others who are almost as talented as that, as that most talented person. Uh, the most talented person will be lucky to an average degree on average. Uh, he might be lucky, he might be really unlucky. On average, he'll have average luck. There'll be others clustered just behind him in the talent domain, uh, and some of them will happen to have been very lucky, and just uh, a little bit of, of weight on, on luck is all you need to push one of them ahead. So you could say that uh, you wouldn't be where you are except for the fact that you were lucky. And when people reflect on that and absorb the idea, it really does change the extent to which they feel they want to give back to investments in the common good. Uh, the, the one experiment we did that was directly relevant for that was to ask three groups of people to imagine uh, uh, or to tell us about a good thing that had recently happened to, to them. In one case, we asked people to describe three things you did that helped cause that good thing to happen. A second group we asked to name three things that you had nothing to do with that were the result of external people or factors of, of one kind or another. And then the third group we just said, tell us about a good thing that happened to you, uh, never mind why it happened. At the end, people got a, a bonus for <clears throat> completing the survey and they were offered a chance to give some part or even all of their bonus to one of three charities they could choose. The ones who were asked to name three things that you had nothing to do with that caused the good thing to happen gave 25% more to charity than the ones who were asked to name three things they themselves had done. The, the control group landed right in the middle. So uh, it's, it's good if people uh, will recognize that at least in part they're, they're in a good spot because I think most people, if you, if you talk to them about that, they, they would concede, maybe grudgingly, that if they'd been born in Somalia, life wouldn't have worked out as well for them as, as, it, as it has under the circumstances. But people are, with the people with the most money are increasingly taking more and more aggressive steps to keep more and more of it for themselves and starve the public se sector of the funds it needs to invest in the next generation coming along. I mean, somebody like me could not graduate from college with no debt. Today. I graduated from college with no debt. Uh, I was able to start saving right away. Uh, kids today have the miracle of compound in interest working against them in reverse uh, when they get out with 40,000, 50,000 of, of debt. Yeah. So, you know, just starting a conversation where people could step back a, a pace or two and recognize that they were fortunate to have landed where they did, I think would help us move forward in making the investments that we need to make. Oh, okay. Did you have something to say, Mr. Murray? Well, I was just going to. I'm, I'm glad to say that I finally find something I can argue with Bob about. Uh, <clears throat> I'm much happier that Bill Gates is, uh, with his, I don't know how many umpteen billion dollars his foundation has, that he's spending that money on good things than that he's turning it over to the government to spend it. I am one of those who has not been impressed by... Uh, uh, by the government's uh, wise use of the resources that are given to it for public goods. And I actually think that the great private wealth that is now going into foundations uh, 
is 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 has a good chance of doing kinds of things the public sector never would do and that I'd like to see done. I think that space exploration, which is, happens to be a personal favorite of mine, uh, is much more likely to happen now through Jeff Bezos and, uh, and, Musk. And, and Elon Musk and so forth than it is with a NASA which is, was wonderful in the 1960s and is now just a typical sclerotic bureaucracy. Yeah, there, there is government rate waste to be sure. Uh, we almost built uh, the bridge to nowhere in Alaska for $300 million uh, when there was a ferry that got people back and forth every 15 minutes and hardly ever anybody crossed uh, the, the little body of water that was to bridge. You can find examples like that, but the idea that the, the government sector wastes more than the, the private sector uh, is very widely held, but I think basically false. Uh, if, if you think about the, yeah, peop, I, I appreciate that many people will disagree, but if you think about what's the gain when all the mansions go from 50,000 square feet to 75,000 square feet, suppose, here's a thought experiment. The right answer is in the envelope. Uh, you have to bet your retirement savings on uh, which group will be, be happier, the world where everybody lives in 50,000 square foot mansions or the one where they all live in 75,000 square foot mansions? My money is on the, the, the world where they live in the smaller mansions because it's a, a royal pain in the butt to manage a property beyond a certain size. You'd have all these staff you have to recruit and train and worry about tell-all memoirs and and, and this and that, if the only reason you need 75,000 square feet is to be able to entertain in the fashion that people like you are expected to, uh, that's pure waste. Uh, and it's waste on a scale that, that blows the government waste we can find in specific instances right out of the water. Well, I was talking about wealth in private hands that's being used uh, not to build an extra 25,000 square feet, but that's being used in the case of Bill Gates to eradicate malaria. Yeah, that, and, and, that's uh, good. And, and, and to I go agree. into space and to do the variety of other things. There's a lot of money now that is in private hands that is being deployed uh, on imaginative, creative things that government would never do. And that's a good thing. Uh, I, I'm closely connected to the fu fundraising world and uh, through the university and I know that a lot of the private money goes to build things with people's names on them uh, and uh, monuments to themselves that wouldn't be high on the list of, of things that any, any sensible ranking of, of public projects would come up with. So yeah, it, it's an empirical question in the end. You know, th this is for you, Mr. Murray. You've uh, promoted an idea called the universal basic income and, you know, for a society where we don't have enough jobs for people, you suggested that every person could get a $13,000 a year stipend, take 3000 off for health insurance, and that would be $10,000. But for that program to work, we would have to stop all the transfer programs, Social Security, disability, welfare, agriculture subsidies, and corporate subsidies. And... My question is, where do you think you're going to find the political will to take away Social Security and ag subsidies and corporate subsidies? Do you think that's possible? No. <laughs> no the, the, uh, see, I, I was doing my best to be optimistic, uh, but I have to do that by proposing things that won't happen. That, and the, and, and it's, it's much worse than just that. There was an economist named Mansur Olson who uh, developed uh, the idea of institutional sclerosis, which results when you have an asymmetry of the ability of special interests who really, really want this particular benefit from government and kind of a diffuse public where, you know, the sugar subsidy is the classic thing. You've got sugar farmers who really want that sugar subsidy and millions of Americans would like to pay the world price for sugar, but they don't get very excited about it. So that happens um, thousands of times, and government slowly just sort of 
grinds to a halt. And so that's why we are never going to get a clean tax bill, just as even a rational tax bill, let alone a clean consumption tax. We're never going to get a clean health care uh, bill that does all the many things that could happen from a classical liberal's point of view as well as from a liberal's point of view to make a more rational health care system. It's not going to happen. But uh, because government in many ways now is just simply too burdened by the, the accumulated rust. I don't know how to the, the institutional sclerosis, like your artery is getting clogged. There, there is an annual survey. It's done by a group called Transparency International. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they ask citizens of uh, all the, the major industrial countries and others, uh, to what extent do you feel your government provides honest an honest attempt to grapple with the problems confronting your population? Do you get good value for your tax dollars? Do you view your government officials as honest rather than corrupt? Uh, so it's a whole variety of questions they ask along those lines. And every year, consistently, uh, there are eight or ten countries that come in at the top of that list. Uh, the United States comes in around 25th to 40th on that list. Uh, the ones that come in at the top are Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the Scandinavian countries, a, a handful of others. Uh, the, I, I've traveled to each of those countries. They, they have well-maintained public spaces uh, in the world happiness surveys that try to measure how, how people feel about their lives, uh, probing uh, with questions like the ones you, you mentioned in your, your opening remarks. Those countries have the happiest citizens, that's true of the rich in those countries and of the poor. And the way they get there is apparently by having uh, a responsive government that tends to, to solving the problems that people feel they want most, most urgently solved. And what's different between them and us most transparently is that uh, none of those countries, uh, in none of those countries does the role of campaign finance play anything like the role we see it playing here. And I think we've seen from both sides of the aisle the lament that with money playing a bigger and bigger role in uh, each congressional representative's day uh, on the phone four, four hours a day uh, begging for money and having to listen to donors, what do they want? You're not going to get a health care bill or a tax bill or a, a road program that, that really uh, lines up very well with what the interests of the citizens are, you get what lines up with what the donors want. Well, we will agree to disagree on the role of campaign financing in creating these problems. I think we are, on, we, we are witnessing, I agree with Mansur Olson, it is built in to democracies that also do not have strict limits on what governments can do. Uh, that once governments are basically permitted to do, spend money on just about anything they want to, uh, when they have lots of goodies to give out, uh, there will be people that will be competing for those goodies, and it is an ex inexorable process. So, I think you can. I think you. You. you you're. Uh, it's rounding error of uh, something like campaign financing. Well, you know, I, I love to keep going, but I, I'm. We're getting the sign that it's time to knock off. Mark, you want to say yeah, good night sure. to everybody? Absolutely. Bill, thank you, my friend. Thank, thank you, Mark. All right, folks, thank you very much for coming tonight. I appreciate that. Just for the record, the 50,000-square-foot mansion would be fine with me if anybody wants to donate one. Big enough for you. Yeah, no kidding. Boy, I, I have 25 more questions for him, but unfortunately, we're trying to keep you on schedule here. For those of you who have uh, VIP access, there's going to be a book signing, I believe, out in the lobby to my left as you go out the doors. Our thanks to uh, Dr. Frank and Dr. Murray. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, thanks to Bill McClellan, uh, really one of the great columnists uh, for the Post of all time. I appreciate him being here. And um, thanks to all of you for being here. I, I, should, I should recognize my boss who's in the audience somewhere. Jeff Allen, Program Director of FM News Talk 97.1. Here he is. He's, he, was, he really didn't want me to say that, I could tell. Sorry about that. Uh, but have a great night, folks. Uh, if you're up at 5 in the morning, like I am, I'll be on the radio from 5 to 9 tomorrow on FM News Talk 97.1. Have a great evening. Thank you.